Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are expecting a completely full session today, so we'd like to ask you to please place all backpacks and personal items underneath the chair that you're sitting on and move towards the center of each row so we can make all seats available for those who would like to attend the session. Thank you. The app last year told us the room size is equal. I couldn't find that information. How big is this room? Big. 500? 400? I got to say, I'm happy if I get one person in the audience, so I'm, I'm honored. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah, me too. Matter of fact, the only time people show up is when I present with you, so that's pretty good. Uh, whatever. It's, it's good for me. Right, he was there. <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> So that's a lame excuse. You're going to throw it at us anyway, and you're just going to tell us we're not doing it. Yeah, I know you. I've known you for a few years now. Two, at least. But just remember, we can throw it back. And there are other things up here as well. We got height right here. We, we have the high ground. Yeah. <laughs> Again, these people in the back are just sitting there going, what are they babbling about? <laughs> Maybe they're tired. All right. How many people are here? This is your first VM world. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Wow. Wow. No wonder they're here. They don't know that there's other sessions to go to. They're confused. <laughs> uh, so who's in the audience? So let me ask. Uh, database administrators. Yes? All right. Fantastic. Yeah. VM admins. Yeah, mostly everybody else. Accidental. Managers. Ac Any managers? All right. We got pictures for you. So that'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> what about accidental DBAs? All of you, if you said you're a DBA, nobody goes to school to be a DBA. Exactly. Did anybody here go to school to be a DBA? Liar. <laughs> what about? <laughs> what? They didn't exist when I went to school. <laughs> OK. I'm sorry. Yes. The gentleman in the front has pointed out that databases didn't exist when he went to school. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, you're experienced. <laughs> Hammer and chisel, yes. So what about people like me? Um, other duties as assigned. <laughs> Everybody? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, architects. Any architects? No? Oh, one. OK, one. Cool. And who just doesn't like raising their hand? Look at that. That's a lot. All right. <laughs> now, loaded question. If you're not a DBA, how many of you hate your DBAs? Uh, OK, but I am a DBA, and I hate DBAs. <laughs> I'm a DBA and a VM admin. And I, you know, I generally have uh, difficulty with honestly everybody. But you know, <laughs> I was going to say, do you have difficulty with yourself at times? All the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a different session. <laughs> that one's at the bar later. Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> that that happens later. Yeah. Uh, actually, are you meet the experts later? That's today. You are in that. So there's a meet the experts session that I'm participating in. I don't know why he's not there. Uh, from two to three. So if you really wanted to come and talk about performance tuning for DBAs, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. I'll be there for the whole hour from two to three, although I don't know where the Meet the Experts area is. Let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be there. Uh, they just told me pod 10. I really sounded kind of sci-fi-ish, you know, meet me at pod 10. Sweet. <clears throat> it's some, yeah, it's like in the back room. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so actually, that's another point as well. Just so you know, if you do need to reach us after the session, I don't know if there's another session right after us, but if there's a number of people, if there's a lot of questions, uh, do know that we will step out into the hall, try to get to them all, but you can still reach us at the ask, uh, Meet the Experts session between two and three. Yeah. And if you can't make that, we both got cards up here if you want to shoot us an email. Oh, yeah. I'd be happy to answer anything. I do have a card somewhere. What time is it? It is 11.24. Oh, it's got another five minutes. Five more minutes of slapstick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what else do we need to know about them? So here's a, okay, here's a loaded question. How many of you have all of your production database servers virtualized? That is wow. Awesome. So wait, is there anybody here not virtualized at all? One person. No, that, don't be don't be shy. Don't be but shy. I will ask. Why why do you have no vir, no virtualized servers right now? Just the databases aren't virtualized. Okay. One of them. All right. 
Databases are always the last thing to be virtualized. Always. Yes. Yeah. But here we are. So we, I mean, I've been asking that question for years. Yeah. And every it, year we ask, and it's shifted because it used to be nope. I mean, just ten years ago, people, would, I'm no way I'm ever virtualizing any of my servers. What's the point? Yeah. And here we are, ten years later. And if you just replace virtualization with cloud, you just hear the same comments. No way I would ever do that with my. Yeah, you will. You will. You will. Yeah. The fun thing is, I virtualized all of production databases in 2004, two years before somebody told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was a little interesting back then, but things change. I mean, now the biggest database I virtualized was uh, actually 128 CPUs, two and a half terabytes of RAM, and just over a petabyte of storage on one VM. How busy was it? Uh, steady state, we needed 800,000 IOPS during the business day. All virtual. <clears throat> All virtual. Worked great. And you, <laughs> and you did it by clicking next, 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 and taking all the defaults. Oh yeah, yeah. It it, it took it's me easy. it took me six weeks to virtual or to click next, next, finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was one of those. We had to prove that it could handle it because they flat out told me no way. And yeah. guess what? You can do it. You know, yeah. you had to you had to pay attention. You had to monitor it properly. Hence the impetus for the session. But you can do it. How long is the session? An hour. An hour. All right. Because we could talk all day. Saturday, I did. Yeah. I did the, it's actually, if you're interested, for next year, uh, Saturday, this past Saturday, I did the SQL Server on VMware all day boot camp. It's 10 and a quarter hours. There are a few people in here from that session. So, thank you. Uh, it was an absolute blast. I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, 500 level deep dive on how to see what Numa node the VM's running on, how to see the actual overhead from the ESXi kernel on storage and memory. And it's just an absolute blast. It's one of those, I wish I could get into all of that here from an absolute you know, nerd level. <laughs> um, don't have the time here. We're getting to it as deep as we can, though. So think about it for next year. It's up to you. Really, I'm your moral compass on this, well, on Twitter? <laughs> think about, yeah. yeah. I don't think you went far enough. Here. Sorry. Not really. I think we should just get started. What's wrong? They're going to lock us in here. Is that Sean? That's Sean. Look, that's Sean. Hey. Hi, Sean. You got a face fro now. I know. See, I didn't recognize <laughs> him. He's got a little silver in it, too. It really threw me off. Yeah. Cool. Two minutes to go. Really? Two minutes? Sir. We'll give him two minutes. It's a long walk. So is everybody enjoying the conference in Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So what, do you, what would you like better, here or San Francisco? Here. Cool. Really? <laughs> I live here. Ah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it's the next four years here. Really? really? Wow. So you That's great. That's great news. Yes, cheaper here than San Francisco. But you're here and not in San Francisco. So there's a trade-off. Cool. Come on in, everybody. We've got plenty of seats up front, and we only pick on people in the back, so you're good. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's not true. We're going to pick on everybody. Yeah, and each other, in case you haven't so, noticed already. Still some people coming. Actually, she told us to get started because people want to be straggling in even a few minutes into it. So. Yeah. Uh, what else do I need to know? You know what? I didn't ask. Uh, developers. Do we have any developers here? I should know that. Cool. Just, a, just a couple. All right. Very cool. So mostly, mostly sysadmins, storage admin, database admin. Yeah. All right. Sysadmin crowd. We can work with that. Yeah. So we're going to show you how to get a good amount of performance back from your database servers and actually mon monitor it and quantify it. Yeah. Well, sure. That's the goal. That is the goal. I think we can do it. 
I know we can. In an hour. We'll try. All right. Otherwise, we'll spill out there and keep going. Do you have a clicker? I do have a clicker. All right. Cool. You want to get her? What was that? I don't know, but there's every now and then there's that noise too. So okay, I might have. We to, I might they, have they to. put us in the back room. <laughs> I'm not saying it was a wrong choice. I'm just saying we are definitely. Well, see, we hear all this stuff back here, and it's like my official job title is technical exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> so I might have to try to apply it to non-technology as well. Go for it. You want to start? Go for it. Let's get started. Sweet. Hi, I'm Tom. Hi, Tom. Okay, I'm sorry. That was lame. So <laughs> I know it's the third day of VMworld. It's your first VMworld. You're probably a little tired. Been walking around. Had no idea how big Vegas could be, right? But we're going to try it again, and I won't judge you much. Hi, I'm Tom. Hi, Tom. Thank you. And, and I'm David. Hi, David. <laughs> And we are here to talk about performance tuning and monitoring for virtualized database servers. Everybody in here, we already went through, mostly sysadmins. Everybody's virtualized except for one guy and one database. We'll fix that for you soon. And uh, let's see, we've got a few slides to go through that they put in here, and I think you've probably already seen. So where are they? Cool. So what this says is for those of you that don't have 67% of your database servers virtualized already, you're behind the curve. There's a lot of good reasons for virtualizing this stuff. 67% of SQL Server. Oracle, a little more interesting around licensing, uh, but you can definitely do it. We've got some really good numbers up here. Uh, yeah, user groups. Uh, so anybody here a member of VMUG, VTUG? Or anybody here not a member? Because if you're not, you should be. Yes. All right. Uh, what else we got? Other speakers and sessions, if you haven't seen them. There's a list of everybody essentially in this track. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, this is critical databases. OK. So plenty of other sessions and uh, speakers that you should be checking out during the week, which is almost done at this point. Uh, survey. Survey to go take, or survey results. Yeah, if you're interested, uh, IOUG put out a really good survey about virtualization adoption use, uh, just talking about how Oracle virtualization is on the uptick and how if you're not already doing it, you really should strongly consider it. All right. Some books, if you haven't, has anybody checked out the virtualizing SQL Server, VMware, virtualizing Oracle? Has anybody read those books? Yeah, yeah, good. If yeah, you yeah. haven't, buy them at the store out here. They are fantastic. Very, very good books. And you can get them signed yesterday. <laughs> like I said, they made us put these slides in. Actually, this one oh, right are they? here. Another hour. Cool. But we're here for an hour, so. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the SQL Server book, uh, I'm speaking with Mike again on a repeat session tomorrow. If you have the book with you, I'm sure he'll sign it. And that will increase the face value by a signature. By, yes, one signature. <laughs> uh, and the PASS virtualization chapter. If you're not familiar with PASS, it's yet another user group focused organization. If you're not familiar with it, I bet the DBAs are, but maybe the virtual or uh, the VM admins are not. There former, is a former past president. Sure. Guy. There is a user group, a virtual user group, specifically for virtualization. So you should go check that out as well. Uh, Mr. Klee, you speak at that user group? Frequently? I do. I, I try to speak for that user group uh, quarterly. It's online, it's free, it's recorded. A lot of really good info from a lot of really good speakers and me. <laughs> 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 disclaimer, uh, yeah. What is that? What? Yeah. Disclaimer. Yeah. Disclaimer just says you're here. You're here. You're here, and you recognize that we are a little off kilter. All right. <laughs> so let's talk about why you're here today. Uh, I'm going to make some assumptions as to what brought you into the room. First, that you have database servers that you um, that should be virtualized, but maybe they aren't. So that might describe one person at least. Or it could be the case that you have database uh, servers that you want to virtualize but can't for one reason or another. Or you have database servers that you're simply afraid to virtualize. How or, many of you fall into that category? Yeah. Yep. Or that you have database servers that are virtualized that you simply want to know more about. Or perhaps you just know that DBAs are scary when they're mad. I'm certain <laughs> one of those buckets describes you here today. <laughs> uh, a little bit about David. Yeah. I'm uh, lucky enough to be a Microsoft MVP and a VMware V expert. Uh, I have made a, a living uh, in the, for the last three years with my own company with being a, a specialist in SQL Server virtualization and performance tuning. I basically made the, I found a way to make a good living uh, being a professional geek. 
Yeah, um, your company? Uh, what we do, we're Hairflux Technologies. Uh, we focus on the convergence of how infrastructure and cloud come together with data. Performance tuning, HADR. What you're getting in this session is honestly 15 years of SQL Server virtualization experience, SQL Server and Oracle. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable saying to you here today that he is one of the world's leading experts when it comes to virtualizing SQL Server for the work that he's done over the past 10 years. So if you ever have a question about virtualizing a database server, it starts with David Klee and it works its way down from there. Checks in the mail. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually hoping it's a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue, but that's different. All right, uh, a little bit about me. We already went over, my name's Tom. I love data. I work with a lot of data. Uh, I have a few awards as well and certifications. I am a VMware V expert, which I think is awesome. And uh, I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, just like Mr. Klee. We're both V experts as well. Uh, yeah, that's enough about that. I work for SolarWinds. If you don't know uh, SolarWinds, you should. We make some wonderful tools. We can handle all of your infrastructure monitoring needs. My specialty, of course, is database performance and tuning. Uh, we have a little product called DPA. If you haven't stopped by the booth, you should. Come check us out. I'd love to talk to you more about databases and everything else we do. All right, so here's the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to talk about why database performance matters, because there might be some of you in here that don't understand the real critical criticality of why database performance matters. We're going to talk about why the database is the resource bottleneck in your organization. We're going to go through solution techniques. We'll spend a lot more time on solution techniques uh, today and in this hour. And then we're going to take questions, comments, and concerns at the end. All right. So before we get started, uh, first thing, are you afraid of your database? And not just because of the DBAs. Anybody here afraid of their database? It's OK. It's all right. Couple people, everybody else, you're not afraid of the database. That's good, no, that's good. So here's the thing. If you are afraid of your database, this is what I always want people to understand. I like to think in terms of buckets. I try to remind people of this, that I don't care if you're running Linux, Unix, Windows. And for me, I don't care what database you have. That's Oracle, DB2, it is Microsoft SQL Server, it is MySQL, it's even the artist formerly known as Sybase. Okay, I don't care what database platform you have, I don't care if it's Linux, Unix, Windows, you have the same resource bottlenecks, and that is memory, disk, network, and CPU. And when you think of things in terms of buckets like that, it actually gets a little bit easier when you try to have a performance tuning methodology. So when it comes to virtualization, it's the same thing. So when all people have fears about virtualizing, it's like, hold on a second, don't worry too much, you still have the same resource bottlenecks. Where you go to collect your information changes. But what you do with the information and the actions you take are actually going to be very much the same now as they were back in the physical world. Uh, so why does database performance matter so much? Well, business application workflow begins and ends with the database. It is. Data is your company's most critical asset. And I'm not just talking about your CRM. I'm talking about every piece of data that is inside of your organization is what makes your organization thrive. That's why you have to protect it. If you're a DBA here, your job, your number one job is recovery. Everything starts and ends with the database. And of course, there can be a negative business impact, say if somebody's hanging around waiting for a beach ball in an hourglass all day. That's when the phone rings and somebody just tells you, hey, the system is a little bit slow. You've got to go figure out why that is. And the end result often is just throwing hardware at the problem. To me, throwing hardware at the problem is the same. Let me ask, uh, anybody here ever been told something's slow, something's wrong, and you said, you know what, I'll just go add a couple of vCPUs to that server and see if it fixes it? Nobody's done that. <laughs> a few people have done it. Don't be bashful. We've all done that. Yep. But that's the same as, uh, you know what, I don't know what the problem is, let's just go buy a bigger server. You're just doing it at a different scale. Right? It's a little easier for you to do that. But the thing is, is that if it does solve the problem, are you going to go spend the time as to figure out what the problem really was? No, you're like, you just need more CPUs, and you walk away. Could have just been one query at that one moment. You might have no idea about that. So throwing hardware and money at the problem only takes you so far. So there's a quote up there. Bad code and design will bring even the best hardware to its knees. Now, who said that? Yes, I did. Who did that? I usually give things, I don't have anything to give away. I, all I can give you is a hug. So see me later. <laughs> see me later, all right? Yes, I said it, just now. 
Uh, it's something I've said for a while, actually. But yes, I can write, say, just a few lines of code, and I can bring the best hardware to its knees. And for the two developers in the audience, I know you know this is true, because I, as a former developer, yes, that's what we do. We do things, we try things, and things break. That is our mission, right? So when you think about this, how uh, why database performance matters so much is that the result is usually just this waste of time and money in this never-ending cycle. You never really get into the root cause and trying to figure out what the problem truly is. And uh, we can mean Dave come back. How often do you find just a poor configuration choice is the reason? How many seconds are in the day? Yeah, how many seconds in the day? You look at somebody and you go, well, why is it configured that way? I don't know. Why should it not be configured that way? So as a VM admin, your goal is to make that infrastructure and make sure, certain it's not the bottleneck, right? Because you don't want to be blamed for anything. Your goal is to make sure that wherever the issue is, it isn't with your infrastructure at any level, right? Or is anybody here happy to take on that blame? No, you don't want that. So you want to shift the bottleneck onto the code. Sorry, developers, that's where we're going to put it. It's always code. <laughs> it's always code and design. Right? Design was great when it started, but your workload and needs have changed. And it went from being a Ferrari, now it's kind of like a pickup truck, and it doesn't perform as well. That happens. It's okay? It's the reality. And don't even get me started on other vendor code and things like that. So, <laughs> uh, I still hear, I just heard in the booth today, uh, uh, this week, I'm being told I can't virtualize this database server. Okay. Who's telling you this? All right, it's so and so. They're saying it just can't be done. Don't believe it. We, you can do it. I know you can do it. Mostly everybody in here has already done it. Now keep in mind that this is why the database has become the resource bottleneck in your environment is because if you are experienced enough as this gentleman in the front row, if you have that level of experience, you remember back to when virtualization came out and your goal was not performance, it was for consolidation. Right? Anybody here virtualized for performance 10 years ago? No. Wait, one person says yes, I'm going to doubt you. <laughs> you say, you, but you did, okay. So we, got, we have Mr. Edge Case in the back. Yes, great. Everybody else, though, was consolidating. You were taking racks and you were trying to consolidate. It was a physical consolidation effort. That's what you went through. And physical or logical consolidations, right? So those racks became that. Well, what that means is every server was treated the same. File server, it was like a database server. The first virtualized database servers I got handed to me, assigned to me, they were awful. And when I went to it, they go, well, it's like a file server, right? Database has files. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> it looks like we just can't virtualize these database things. No, you just have to treat it a little bit differently. All right, so three keys to database virtualization success. One is you need to think opposite. You need to think more about performance-oriented engineering. That's a great term that David coined. You should trademark that. Have you not yet? Nope. You should have t-shirts made up. You're a performance engineer. Hmm. So, and then you need to work with the DBAs. All right, these are your three keys. So uh, David's gonna walk us through some of the solution techniques. Uh, right, that's where we're at. Yeah. Here, you take that. Sweet. Okay. There are an exceptional amount of interesting things that change with virtualization. But the funny thing is, the more it changes, the more it stays the same. It just kind of shifts a little bit. Um, how many of you have the virtual CPU configuration set up exactly the way the DBAs ask you? You know, 64 CPUs, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a lot of what they're going from is what the vendors tell them. Well. The interesting thing here is the virtual CPU configuration is one of those things where, in some cases, I have gotten a 400% performance improvement by reducing the CPU count. And in that particular example, we went from 64 to 4 CPUs. Pretty interesting. Storage and availability. How many of you have had uh, significant problems with storage underneath your big database servers? Exactly. You call VMware today, over 80% of the support calls are around storage, configuration, and performance of that platform. It's pretty incredible. Big database servers will destroy the I.O. if they're not properly tuned. Networking. Here's the interesting thing. How many of you are on all flash? Ooh, great question. Cool. All flash. How many of you are thinking about all flash? Guess what? 
don't just drop in all flash and expect things to get better. We'll talk about why, because the infrastructure bottlenecks will always exist. Where does it move after you introduce all flash? Okay, solution techniques. Interesting thing here, if the DDA comes to you and says, I need 16 CPUs, what do you do? Do you give the 16 or do you ask them to demonstrate why they need the 16? It's a statistical, uh, it, it's proof behind it. If you oversize a VM, it can actually slow it down just as much as if you give it too few CPUs. It's kind of like putting a parachute on the back of a moving car. It's going to slow it down because you have to schedule all this stuff. The, uh, the operating system has more to manage. The database engine has more to manage. Find the number of CPUs that you need today. RAM sizing, the same thing. If you oversize it, there's this thing called a memory, uh, idle memory tax. You got to worry about that. That can actually slow it down. It also makes the database servers uh, more prone to uh, ballooning and memory reclamation if there's a memory congestion. Disk configuration is a big one because guess what? How many of you have had the situation where the DBA says, my storage latency is 100 milliseconds? You look at the SAN and it says one. That's a big challenge. Well, guess what? There's only about 8,000 pieces between that database server and that disk array. You have to worry about how to go through all those. And the networking and the interconnects as well. We've got to go through each one of these. How many of you collect performance metrics across your environment today? Thank you. If you do not, I implore you, you must start collecting performance metrics after, after all these layers. Because guess what? If somebody comes to you and says, quote, it's slow, you have to have the evidence behind it to say, well, what's it like when it's fast? Let me look. What's it like on a good, normal day? And then you're able to go look very quickly and go say, hey, well, this thing's uh, you know, out of whack. Let's go look there. If you are not collecting, by the way, if you're not collecting, come talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. There, are, there are a number of very good utilities out there that we can use to go uh, collect a lot of this data and report on it properly. Okay. Yes? Uh, we're going to get there. So the question is, can we talk about reservations? Yeah, yes. we will get there. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. The, uh, the VM construction itself is very interesting. If you right-click Create New VM, select Windows, give it a name, select Resources. Right now, let's say I want uh, 12 CPUs. It's going to give you 12 virtual sockets, each with one virtual core. Challenge there is that CPU configuration then passes into the VM. So what's better? Do we have 12 NUMA nodes to manage from the virtual machine? Do we have to deal with that at the hypervisor? How does the hypervisor place it? How does the operating system treat it? How does the database server treat it? Because both Oracle and SQL Server are very good about NUMA management. But if I get 12 nodes to worry about, that's a lot of overhead to go manage that properly. Pair virtual SCSI driver, uh, network adapters. We'll talk about those here. Uh, CPU allocation. How many of you have heard of the term CPU ready time before? That is so cool. Awesome. Every, as every conference I do this, one, uh, the first time I asked it, it was one guy in the back going, eee, because, you, know, <laughs> you know, introverted sys I'm in, right? <laughs> Over the years, it gets better and better and better. How many of you have heard of CoStop? A few. Wow, fantastic. For those of you that haven't, you're about to learn how, if either of those are bad, it's going to wreck your day. Out-of-balance VMs can cause some very interesting concerns. Uh, certain examples where if you fire up a VM, the NUMA home placement is now fixed and finite. And if things start to change in the environment, you can actually have things out of balance. Or they can just be representative of too much activity on the host. Now, this screenshot here is from CPU ready time. What CPU ready time is, it is the measurement of how much time that virtual CPU per VM has spent inside the hypervisor waiting to get scheduled to run on the physical CPU core. Essentially, it's the amount of time your VM is sitting there going, come on, come on, come on. And it's time not spent actually doing what you want. It's measured in milliseconds per polling interval. Polling interval is 20 seconds. So essentially, if you pull up this number right here inside vCenter, Latest, 28 millisecond, 24, 46, 49, 39. This number right here is the summation on the machine. It doesn't tell you how many CPUs are on there, so just throw it away. But now, let me actually show you the math on this. So these numbers look really high here. If you look at the max over the last hour, 53, 85, 73, 74, 64. 
How many of you go look at this regularly? One. Yeah. No, oh, a couple of All of you, shoot me an email, grab my card up here. I have PowerShell to go set up an alert on this per VM based on the CPU count that can actually give you an alert if you don't already have a utility that does this. Let me show you what these values actually mean. Let's pick the biggest one here, uh, 85. Right there, it's 85 milliseconds spent in the queue per 20 second polling interval over the last hour. So what I'm gonna do is see if I can break my presentation here. You're doing a good job of that. Yeah, cool. So let's go 85 divided by 20,000 milliseconds in that polling interval times 100%. Point 425% performance overhead at most on that vCPU in the last hour. That's pretty good. I claim that's perfectly fine. Believe it or not, this is, this is, in this environment, when this screenshot was taken, we had nine, or excuse me, uh, 2.91 vCPUs for every physical CPU core, not including hyperthreading, deployed in that environment. That's the kind of consolidation you can get when you right size the VM properly, when you have the right number of CPUs and the right VNUMA configuration. That is perfectly acceptable. If this starts to creep upwards, the performance on the database server is going to slow down, and that's not good. This is what happens when one gets out of balance. In this case, the NUMA home information was set when the VM was turned on, and somebody magically built a 32-core virtual lab machine that they just turned on and then vMotion onto this machine. This was that was, someone you? What's that? Was that someone you? No. No. No, I got, I got called later in the day when it caused a very significant problem. That right there is half the vCPU cores in that virtual machine running at a 10% performance hit. That's the other half running pretty much in real time. Yeah. It's pretty amazing because guess what? This environment, the database server side was very widely parallelized. That was causing about a 25% performance hit on the database server and they didn't know it. They had built the VM for one virtual socket by 16 virtual cores. Okay. The physical machine was two by 12. This VM had it extended itself beyond what it could fit in that footprint and it actually spilled over. All we did, we turned the VM off, we just set it to two by eight, and problem magically went away. Three clicks. They just got 25% performance back. It's pretty cool. Now, co-stop, this is where one gets really interesting. If you've not heard of this before, this is the impact of very large VMs or a lot of uh, concurrent activity. Essentially, what goes on here is if you have a lot of eCPUs, the schedulers are not always linear, otherwise things would just really slow down. So if the hypervisor detects that these things are too far out of balance, or if the VM says, I need to run this on all these CPUs at the exact same time, it'll actually slow down or suspend some of the vCPUs until the others catch up. Again, the amount of time spent there is milliseconds over that polling interval. Now, whereas the other one, you can see the percentages weren't that bad, um, this number right here, 549 with a maximum in the 4,000 range, that represents a 92% performance problem on a web content server. That's a bad day because this was an e-commerce website. That was very, very bad. And you can see what happened right here. They actually they had a problem early in the morning. Bad, bad, bad. Significantly bad. Very, very terrible. And then at 5.10, they called me and I remoted in and we turned it off and things trickled all the way back down to just not good. <laughs> yeah, their environment was very poorly balanced. Uh, essentially, you're going to see rebalancing here or there. You're going to see a blip of things, you know, one or two milliseconds here or there. No problem. Not a big deal. Uh, we had a gentleman that was in the boot camp this last Saturday that after the boot camp said, hey, I think you just solved one of my biggest performance problems that we've been dealing with for nine months. Guess what? If you take a snapshot on a VM, it elevates co-stop. It's all because of how it has to go find the blocks on disk. It's a very, very weird problem, but if you leave a snapshot on a machine, uh, for example, just a VM backup, or if you have uh, just a snapshot sitting out there for whatever reason, guess what? You're gonna get this. The longer it sits out there, the worse it gets. If these numbers are anything over than about 20 or 30 per vCPU for more than a couple of seconds, you're gonna feel it. If these numbers are in the hundreds or even thousands, your end users are gonna be calling you. 
There is no alert mechanism inside vCenter to go set this up today. You need to watch this. You need to alert for it. Again, there are good third-party utilities out there that can grab this and alert you on that. Not to scare everybody, of course, but... <laughs> yes, sir? That's a great question. The question is, what are the thresholds for good versus bad for ready and co-stop? Uh, essentially, if I'm on ready time, I like to say 25 to 3% or less is considered good. 25 to 3.5%, I consider kind of that, that gray area. Anything above that is going to be a significant enough performance hit where your end users are going to notice. Now, whether or not they call or not depends on how well you've trained them. <laughs> What's the uh, VMware? Threshold, is it 10%? The VMware threshold is 10%. And that's a very good threshold for things like file servers. Right. And, you know, domain controllers maybe, but not for your business critical apps, especially the database servers. Now, co-stop, I don't really have a threshold. I say if you're greater than zero for any length of time, you should investigate it. Because you'll see little tiny bits of rebalancing every once in a while on a normal day. But other, if it's sustained, you have a problem. Yeah. CPU write sizing, we talked through this. Um, so, loaded question. How are you going to get the DBAs to show you what you need? You have to work with them because the hypervisor makes some assumptions that uh, the database server contradicts. I'll talk about a couple of those here in a second. We already talked about idle CPUs. Now, the, the challenge here is if I tell you you need to write size this thing today, what happens? And so tomorrow, somebody adds a new database to the machine. The next day, somebody does an application upgrade and it adds three more reports and it changes how things are done. You need to do this right-sizing analysis at least quarterly. If you're on a really busy machine, you need to do it probably monthly. If not a lot's changing, maybe twice a year. But you really need to get in the habit of doing this for all the big, you know, big resource-intensive VMs that you've got. Now, if you want a presentation that'll probably put you to sleep, but it's got a lot of info on how to actually go get the raw data and analyze it, I got a video up here uh, for how to go do that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Let me know when. <laughs> Well, are, these, aren't the these, slides, the slides will be available. The slides will be up here really soon, or shoot me an email, I'll send you a link to it. Okay, NUMA. How many of you are familiar with NUMA? Familiar with it. Cool. NUMA is awesome. NUMA is what happens when you have a, more than one socket on a modern motherboard. It's essentially, uh, it's called non-uniform memory access. And what it means is the motherboard has multiple spots for CPUs. It's also got memory. Long time ago, they realized that the interconnect between CPU and memory became a bottleneck. And they ended up, uh, so AMD pioneered it, Intel perfected it. What they did was they actually took memory from one big so single spot and they basically wrapped the socket. So it's very, very close to each individual socket. You can see right here. Now, this CPU can access this memory, but it takes longer. Physics dictates it's a lot longer to go get. And as a result, if you can keep your VM right here, it'll actually be faster. Now, the only time that this happens is if the, the operating system, in this case VMware, is actually aware of this and can pass this through. vSphere is, Windows is, SQL Server and Oracle are. If the VM can fit inside one of these, you want to configure that. So number of virtual CPUs and number of sockets. Set that to number of sockets as one. Do some testing on there if these things are really big. Uh, you might find that it might balance out a little bit better. But if the VM can't fit in here, then take a look at your architecture and test. You know, is it better to give, let's say, 16 virtual sockets, each with one core, or set the VM to, say, two virtual sockets and eight cores and actually force it to span appropriately across these nodes? Do your due diligence and test. VMware says one thing, uh, experience says another with those two architectures, but test, because every workload is different. But you can actually get significant performance gains by balancing here properly. Now, um, this slide is slightly, a uh, little bit out of date. Hot out of CPU on 5.5 and below will disable VNUMA. Uh, actually, 6.0 as well. It will flat out disable it. So if you've got 16 CPUs and a funky configuration and you have that checked, Forget about it. You might be taking up to a 30 or 40% performance, or performance hit on that uh, VM. 
Now, vSphere 6, if you have hot RAM, uh, hot plug RAM enabled, that will not break vNuma, and life is good. And by default, this thing only extends this into the VM when you hit a nine or more virtual CPUs. You can override this, but be careful. Do some testing, see if it's gonna give you a performance bump or not. Um, got another write-up here if you're interested. Again, that's a really dull, dry read, but there's a lot of good info on there. <laughs> now, if I were to tell you, give me 16 CPUs for a virtual SQL Server VM, what's better? Two sockets by eight virtual core, four by four, eight by two, one by 16, 16 by one? I don't know, we gotta test it. The good thing is your DBA hopefully has a way to take a production workload and replay it against a, a known database. If you don't, there's actually stuff built into the database engine now called distributed replay or some other mechanisms where you can actually take that workload, replay it, and go see exactly what your resource consumption would be with these different configurations. SQL 2016 changes, I'll mention that here in one second. This is a synthetic workload in one particular hardware architecture, and essentially at different performance configurations, so four by four, eight by two, two by eight in this install, that is a 31% performance difference. I'll repeat that. That's a 31% performance difference in three clicks. That's significant. Now again, this is a synthetic workload on specific hardware. It's a four socket by 10 core physical machine. Your mileage may vary. You need to go test, but you can test. Now, SQL Server 2016 changes all kinds of stuff yet again. If I build a VM in this case for, let's say, um, two by 10 virtual CPUs, so 20 core. SQL Server 2016 now has this thing called soft NUMA built into it. So the database engine will actually reserve the right to take that 10 core virtual NUMA node and subdivide it into two at five cores a piece. Is that better for performance? Don't know, depends on your workload. Is it better for performance if you configure the VM for four by five instead of two by 10? Again, you gotta test. Memory allocations, 100% no memory over commitment in your environment at all, period, hands down, no questions asked. That is one of those things, if you start ballooning inside a mission critical database environment, you gotta watch out. Now, interesting thing here, uh, we talked about reservations. You can and probably should reserve all guest memory for your production SQL servers if you have any chance at all of memory over commit. The fun part there is this can actually shrink the VM swap file. So uh, there was one environment. They were running on a very big all flash array and we checked the box in production and guess what? The swap file shrunk to zero bytes and they got almost two terabytes of all flash sand space back by checking a box. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Makes you look like a hero in that one. Now, how many of you use active memory inside the data, inside vCenter to tell if you need to reduce memory in the VM. No Thank way. you. This is direct proof from VMware corporate in that guide that says don't do that. The active memory counter with any big database server or anything that uses memory as an IO cache says don't trust the counter. This includes vRealize operations manager and its efficiency stack. You gotta be very, very careful there. IO, now we've all got challenges with IO unless you're on all flash and then things shift. Um, how many of you are on what you would consider legacy storage? And we're all friends here. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, it's not the most optimal for virtual big database servers. It'll run, but it's not gonna run well. I mean, you're gonna have high latency in there. The things we gotta really watch out for, multipathing so we can make the best use of the interconnects that we've got uh, the interconnects themselves to see if the speed is there, uh, the controller cache matters, and uh, the raw disk pool speed. Now, the funny thing about the SAN is I always like to say, I don't really care what your RAID configuration is like. I don't care about the controller cache levels. I just need it faster than what you need. Simple as that. Latency matters when it comes to big database servers. Now, we all claim, we all, I mean, you go to the, the vendor floor here and they always say, well, how many, uh, how many IOPS can we do? We can do a million, woo! It's kind of like having a Ferrari. Uh, hopefully we all have Ferraris, yeah, I wish. <laughs> 
When was the last time you hit 200 miles an hour in a fast car just because the speedometer goes up to 200? <laughs> yeah. Now, hopefully it's every day on the way to the grocery store, right? Because <laughs> we all like that. But realistically, it's not. The, the same thing with IOPS. If the thing doesn't need that many IOPS, it's not going to consume it. However, when are you at the stoplight, light turns green, you floor it so you can get up to speed as fast as you can. That's latency. The speed of the transaction to disk and back matters when it comes to the database engine. As fast as you can possibly get it, as low a latency as you can get it, that's what matters. We also need to know what are we doing real time around the clock versus what the maximums in that environment really are. So stress testing the environment versus uh, what we're using normally, not only does it give you what you're doing today, it also tells you just how much overhead and how much of a ceiling we have left. Because everybody sizes a sand for capacity. It's very rare to size a sand for performance. But guess what? What if I got 40 terabytes left on the sand, but I got 2% available remaining performance cap left? That's not good. Because at that point, things start to slow down. VM layer caching. If you're on a traditional sand, there's some really good options out there for actually doing caching underneath the database engine. Most database servers are about 80, 85% read, 15, 20% write. If I can cache half of that, that's, that's that much data you don't have to send out to the SAN and back, and that speeds things up. And it's transparent to the database. There's no extra code you have to do. Some of them can even do read and write. I would say be very careful with that. Do a lot of testing. Make sure that the architecture is sound. But you can potentially get away with that. Storage benchmarking is one of those things. Now, before I go further into this, please don't do this in production during the day. <laughs> <laughs> You can and probably will impact the performance of everything in your environment. And I'm not going to be liable for that, because I told you not to, even though it sounds kind of fun, right? <laughs> um, if you've heard of a utility from Microsoft called SQL I.O., uh, it's now gone. They deprecated it. They pulled it. There's a replacement called Disk Speed. It works really, really well. It's pretty cool. There's also another one uh, that works on Unix and uh, Windows called FIO. Um, what you need to do, do stress tests on different permutations of read and write, random and sequential, change up the workload intensity, change the block size, change the file location, all that kind of stuff. Collect latency, IOPS, and throughput. Those are the metrics that really matter because every once in a while you can go find something really, really weird, such as this. This is what happens when we were flushing controller cache on a SAN and they weren't aware of the limitation. The interesting thing, through going back and looking at the raw data off the machines, we found that they were right about here on the sequential write workload when they were doing database level backups. That's not good, because their databases were by about 150 gigs a month, and they were going to hit that within three months. And at that point, the, the write performance in that environment would have just gone downhill very quickly. And that's not really where you want to be. Now, storage benchmarking layers. I really say test from within the VM, but measure every single point along the way. Because what happens, you know, in that example earlier, 100 millisecond latency here, 0.1 millisecond latency here. That can be idle. You can have a bottleneck further upstream. So you need to record and monitor and measure all these different points, like each individual controller, external port, cache hit ratios, port consumption, HBA or network adapter consumption there, VM kernel metrics in here disk throughput within the VM to see if you balance things properly. You can do this. It is a fair amount of work to get it set up, but once you're done, things are great. And I say this because here's an example. Customer, uh, we had no visibility into the VM environment whatsoever. Guess what? Things were, quote, slow. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. We've never heard that before, right? So what we found out, this was four VMs on, uh, on four blades. So one VM per blade, one chassis, a couple of 8-gig fiber uplinks. Things were slow. Infrastructure team said everything was fine. They basically told us to go away. We knew things were bad. So I took the throughput from Windows on the first VM and just graphed it. We averaged this out over an entire month just to see what the normal trends were. That's up to 600 megs a second that thing was grabbing. That's, you know, pr it's a pretty significant machine. And then we added another VM on top of that. So this is the second VM in the same chassis that's going through the same fiber interconnects coming out of the chassis. Okay? We add a third. And then we add a fourth. See anything weird on this one? 
So we had two 8 gig fiber ports on the back of the thing cabled up, right? That is the limit on two 8 gig fiber ports. That is the limit of one 8 gig fiber connection. So they weren't multipathing and they were maxing out the connections that they had. And then we went back into the database engine and overlaid the disk latency as seen by the DBAs. And um, yeah, that's not a problem there. <laughs> so we presented this to the CIO with everybody in the room. I physically watched the guy squirt about a cup of coffee through his nostrils when he saw it, and that was really pleasant. And then the infrastructure team lead goes, oh, OK. Yeah, we got six more ports on there. We'll cable them up this afternoon. <laughs> Nine months they fought through that. And we had to work on that a month to get a lot of this data. Those are billable hours, though. I hate, <laughs> I hate doing that. Oh, I hate doing it. Network throughput testing is another one. If you're on all flash storage, or if you're moving lots of data around, such as database level backups, guess what? Latency there matters as well. Throughput matters. You can go test this. We got a simple free utility that we, that we love to use called iPerf. It's compiled for Windows. It also works on Linux and Unix. Uh, I got a how-to guide right here. Uh, you can actually do a throughput test. It's real simple. It's a command line utility. You download it and run it. iPerf minus S gives you the, the target. iPerf minus C, IP, 10 second, 10 worker threads gives you the ability to go test point A to point B. There's your output. That is 8.86 .8 gigabit per second on a 10 gigabit network. There's a little bit of stuff going on in the background. I claim that's pretty good. This was without jumbo frames going on in the network. So that's about as good as that's going to get. Guess what? If you're on a 10 gig network and you see things measured in kilobits, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff is real. <laughs> Also do some latency checks, things like that. Now, if you move a lot of data around frequently, you can actually test, if the VMs are on the same port group, you can actually test co-locating the VMs on the same host. If you set it up right, if they don't have to traverse to the network switch and back, it stays in the back plane of the machine. Guess what? That number actually jumps to about 13 gigabit on a 10 gigabit network, and the only reason it doesn't go beyond that is because iPerf is single threaded and we max out a core. Loads of fun. So you've got to monitor the monitoring tools that you're using as well. <laughs> Performance metric collection. Go for it. Sure. So there's a few people here that already mentioned uh, you're not collecting metrics. And uh, i got to be honest, I, I can't even fathom why you wouldn't be collecting anything. So you must be collecting something. You just didn't want to raise your hands. But uh, it's incredibly important for you to not just be collecting things, but to be collecting the right things. All right, how do you know what right things are? Usually because you get yelled at for something and then you say, oh, let me go add in that metric collection now so I don't get yelled at the next time for not having the data. But uh, for me, what I try to remind people is, especially for database performance, you've gotta be able to collect metrics. And like David just had this great chart where he correlated the HBA throughput and then the LUN latencies, right? You've gotta have something that does that for your databases. So what I'm talking about is you gotta be able to correlate the queries when they're running, what they're waiting for, all that information, you've gotta be able to correlate that with what's happening in the VM layers. So I'm talking what's happening at the guest layer, what's happening at the host layer, and what's happening at the storage layer. Because you need that visibility. Because, well, has anybody here ever, in your experience, have you ever been working on a problem, right? You spent a few hours on it, it's not solved yet, phone rings, somebody says, hey, whatever you did to fix it, thanks, everything's great. <laughs> Has that happened to a few people in here? Once or twice, right? And you scratch your head and go, I haven't done anything. Now, usually I tell people, hey, I didn't do anything, but so next time you need nothing done, just think of me, I'm your guy. <laughs> so what I've started to realize, so as we were going virtual, I, I just put pressure on the, the server team. I said, I just need read-only access into vCenter to get the metrics so I can see what's happening. No, you're not the server admin. We're not going to get that. So by the way, uh, VM admins, if your DBAs ask for read-only access to vCenter, you should just give it to them. And if you're not, you should understand that as DBAs, we already have access to the vCenter database, and we will write our own queries. 
and we will get the data we need. Uh, or but, I give them the ones I've already written. He gives them, yeah. <laughs> it's not that hard to navigate through vCenter database in order to figure out what data you need. But you want to be able to correlate the information. Uh, we don't really have the graph here, but uh, you just want to be able to say, hey, look, somebody called at this time, and I can see, you know what? Six guests got migrated to that host because there was an event somewhere else. Storage, a CPU, things are going to be a little slow for a few hours until we migrate that stuff off. So you don't want to spend too much time trying to tune a query that somebody's yelling is slow right now until you fix what the real problem is, which is simply you had to move some stuff around, things will be slow for a little while, but it'll go back to normal as soon as I can. That's the information you need to have when you're doing database performance tuning. You've got to be able to be collecting these metrics because within five minutes, you've got to be thinking in terms of buckets. Is this something internal to SQL Server or external? It's external. Okay, so if it's external, then where it is? And you go one bucket at a time until you can narrow your focus on what the issue truly is. So if you really aren't collecting those metrics, you need to be. Otherwise, you will always be in the dark, and that phone is always going to be ringing, and you're never going to have an answer. Now, that's great if you want to keep your job forever, because you'll just be keep doing the same things over and over again and never improve things. But if you're like me, you're lazy, and you want to be left alone. So you want to fix things right so your phone stops ringing. Right? The best DBA is a lazy DBA. Exactly. So, and by the way, on this, um, you want charts and graphs for the managers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we have lots of pictures for managers. Yes. Uh, all layers matter. You want the metric overlay. Like I said, David had a nice way of presenting that information for you, so you could just have that nice overlay. That's the type of data that you want to be able to present to somebody. You want to be able to show that there's a correlation between what's happening here and what you're seeing there, right? So we've got a few tips and tricks that we've put together over the years. In, as we call for monster workloads, right? I asked earlier if you're afraid of your database is a monster. So tips and tricks that you can all do right now that you may be doing, may not be doing, right? Number one, don't run everything all at once. <laughs> know your workloads, right? Now, this is true. So how do you divide up your environment right now? Uh, you know, back in the day, we talked about, well, that was the production host. So all of our production stuff went on that host. And somebody said, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense because that host goes down, all of our production down. So maybe only a few production systems and test and dev and mix it all together and stuff like that. Well, that sounds great, except that you have this critical production system during the day, and then you have you know, the test system that's getting used most of the time. And now they're running on the same host at the same exact time. Actually, it might make sense if you just thought about when the activities were happening for the guests that are on these hosts. Yeah. And then DBAs have to go run routine maintenance all the time on a lot of these different databases. They're very resource intensive. Guess what? They like to schedule them all at the same time. Right. Yeah. And that will bury CPU. It'll bury, bury RAM. It'll definitely bury storage. So work with them. Make sure they stagger all these jobs across the environment just a little bit. They don't have to do much but just enough so they don't overlap too much. And don't dismiss that as just a dev server because a dev server is a production server to a developer, okay? So you can't just be like, it's just dev, it won't get used much. That might be used a lot more than that production server. So just know the workloads, right? And be monitoring for them and have an understanding of what's being used when and why and where. All right, baseline benchmark for performance, which we talked about. Look, if you're not baselining and benchmarking for performance, you're not collecting these metrics, you have no idea what's good or bad. And if somebody calls you and says the system is slow, your, your natural reaction is, well, how fast should it be? That report, it's taking too long. How long should that report run in? I don't know, but it should be faster than this. So if you don't have the metrics in place to say, yeah, I get it, that report should run in a minute. Right now it's taking five minutes. Let me go figure out what it is. If you aren't doing that, you're at a disadvantage every time that phone rings. Exactly. And you know what DBA really stands for. It's default blame acceptor. So when people say it's slow, they're not just coming to you. They're going to them. And guess what? Because it's virtual, they're coming back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell you to avoid thin provisioning. Now, this has been, uh, I've been an advocate, uh, say, against. So what's the opposite of advocate? I forget. Grammar's not me. Anyway. <laughs> Champion? No, the, the opposite of champion. I've been against thin provisioning for years. So uh, these days I'm a little softer on it because of flash. But here's, here's where I tell you thin provisioning, you're going to get hurt. First, uh, the classic case of uh, if all of your guests happen to have a growth event at the same time, you could run out of space. All right? So if you're not monitoring for that, if you don't know how much you've uh, promised versus how much you're actually using, right? If you, have, if you aren't collecting those metrics and if you don't have that uh, alert in place, and for DBAs, it's the same thing. Hey, what if all of your data files grew at once? 
would you have enough space on that disk or not? And are you monitoring for that? I'm, I'm almost certain everybody, every DBA in the room right now just goes, oh, hell no, I've never thought about that, but it could happen, right? And you know it could happen. And I know you've all had transaction logs fill up drives, so you know filling up drives happens. Same thing with thin provisioning. Uh, the, the other thing was fragmentation. So if there's a growth event, it's not a contiguous growth event. Same thing with the data file growth, right? However, with Flash, Flash gives us a wonderful thing called fragmentation, apparently, because there's just stuff all over the place and it doesn't matter. So if you are on Flash, thin provisioning, you don't have the fragmentation headache. You can still have the run out of storage headache. Yeah, and that's a really big deal because now it's not just a database. Now it's yeah, pretty much everything. <laughs> you don't need that. Um, in fact, if you fill up a snapshot or if you fill up a LUN, that's, that's probably the best case scenario there. And you'll know if I architected your environment, if you see a, 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 like a 20 gig text file on the root of every data store called cya.txt. <laughs> it's basically if a LUN fills up, you get in, you delete the file, you just bought yourself some time. This is why everything starts at clean and works its way down. <laughs> he puts a 20 gig file <laughs> that just sits there because if you run out of space, he's like, I can get rid of that right now. You know what used to happen to me was it was backup files, mm -hmm. right? And I've run out of space on the backup drive, so go delete some backup files. I'm like, yeah, I'll get you some space back for the backups and all that. But he told me about that yesterday. It brought back a lot of memories. I'm like, but genius, right? <laughs> Who thinks that? Does anybody else do that? <laughs> genius. <laughs> genius, right? Especially How many people are going to leave here and go do that right now? <laughs> Hit my blog, I actually give you the DD command uh, from the command shell to actually go write a 20 gig text file of zeros. If you're on an all flash array or something that does compression and dedupe, you don't take any extra space, but you just bought yourself a fail safe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad he uses his powers for good and not evil. I just haven't been caught. <laughs> uh, disk performance and data store options. So uh, back in the day, we all know there was pretty big differences between uh, RDMs and uh, VMDKs, right? Those differences are few and far between these days. There's actually only one that I know of, and it really just comes down to how you're doing your architecture. So back in the day, like RDM was how you got a two terabyte file if you needed it. Uh, VMDKs go 64 terabytes now or whatever. Like, there's no difference in size anymore. No, the only difference is how are you architecting your high availability? And RDMs allow for, if you're doing some traditional clustering, maybe not using vMotion, and or basically if you're using clustering, it requires shared storage. Yeah. That's where you're going to be using, that's where you're going to want to think, oh, I'm going to need an RDM here, all right? Now, uh, RDMs, of course, there's differences between these two, all right? But that, that's where you're going to have to make the choice one or the other. Uh, honestly, these days, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure you need it as much. There's no performance difference. There's no performance difference. So it's if just you... an architecture thing, and I would kind of recommend you use vMotion's architecture and yeah. things, but maybe not. No, I don't kind of recommend. I do recommend. Unless you're doing traditional shared storage clustering or anything that requires ownership of a LUN, use VMFS. And there's going to be scenarios when you need that, yeah. but honestly, I think there's fewer scenarios these days where that is just an absolute must. Yep. Uh, they're getting fewer and fewer and fewer, and the technology and the high availability of the technology built into vSphere and everything, I think, has caught up that you could actually just do VMDKs for just about everything. And I think RDMs now are the edge case. Uh, one more. Avoid over-allocation of CPU memory. So is over-allocation a bad thing? No. Not necessarily by itself, right? No. But what does over-allocation lead to? Heartburn. Heartburn. Overcommit. Is overcommit bad? Yes, but you can't get to overcommit unless you've overallocated. So we tell people, uh, overallocation, don't do it. Uh, what's, we recommend 80%. So whatever memory is on, on the host and whatever CPUs are on the host, we recommend you put your workload at about 80%. So if you have all your guests running, you should only be using about 80% of your memory and CPU. Yeah, good, why is that? A good, give me a, one good reason why I would want to leave 20%. CYA, you got to fail something over. Yeah. You need room for growth. You, right? need, you need N plus one minimum design. Right, which is the last thing. Capacity planning. Leave room for growth, right? That's why we recommend that 80% little thing where we say, hey, you might have to move some stuff around. All right, uh, obviously there's overhead for the host and things like that as well, uh, but that's not 20%. But you want to leave room for growth and you want to be, so you monitor your environment and you look at those metrics and when you start creeping more than 80%, you don't think, oh, I, I can just keep allocating more to this. No, that's when you stop and you say, we should really think about what we're doing here, the architecture, and maybe think about adding a new host. Uh, let's see. 
So that was the agenda, what we promised. We talked about why database performance matters, why a database is the resource bottlenecks. We walked through solution techniques. It is now time for questions, comments, concerns. I will remind you there is a survey. We would love to have you fill out the survey for this uh, session. Uh, this is how you can reach us. Uh, I will say thank you, and we will hang around for questions, comments, concerns. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.